again, everybody, and welcome to another read aloud of a spooky Victorian ghost story. Uh, my background, as you can see, I am uh, am experimenting with some different things. Last video we had the bat. Uh, today I've got some little uh, orange Halloween lights because the stores are uh, getting in a lot of stock for my favorite holiday. So uh, welcome. What I will be reading for you today, and I'm still in, in book mo format here, book mode, with an actual physical book, obviously. Uh, the Devil of the Marsh by H.B. Marriott Watson, who was a New Zealand writer and not a hotel chain, which is what uh, I would probably most closely associate with the word Marriott. Uh, yeah, he uh, worked in England. Um, journalism, pretty uh, prolific writer, apparently. But like most writers of the day, he did dip his toes into uh, the spookier side of things, which is what I will be reading for you today. And just uh, the usual warnings that this is a piece of Victorian text and might not align so well with modern sensibilities in terms of um, race, religion, gender, orientation, uh, most things that you can, you can think of, though there might be some of that in here. Uh, there might not be, but I'm just giving you the warning um, just as we head into it, and you can make that call for yourself. This is something you want to, uh, to listen to. Uh, the other change I think I'm going to make this time is I'm actually going to try and um, keep my comments to myself until the end and just sort of focus on reading the story for all of you fine folks out there. And I can see in the, uh, the video on the desktop here that my hair is uh, looking, well, it looks how my hair looks when I curl it. This is what it does. I, I've grown to accept it. Um, I have kind of thinner hair. There, there's not a lot of it, but it does, left to its own devices, it does have a bit of a wave sometimes, and this is just what happens when it gets, uh, when I curl it. Um, my hair doesn't hold curls from a curling iron particularly well, so I use, uh, the pillow roller format overnight, and the more I do it, the more I actually decide, uh, I'm, I actually quite like it. I think it looks kind of cool. I'm totally into the sort of swamp witch goblin aesthetic that I seem to be leaning into these days. So, and uh, without any more preamble or me telling you uh, more about my, my hair struggles, let's get into The Devil of the Marsh by H.B. Marriott Watson. It was nigh upon dusk when I drew close to the great marsh and already the white vapors were about, riding across the sunken levels like ghosts in a churchyard. Though I had set forth in a mood of wild delight, I had sobered in the lonely ride across the moor and was now uneasily alert. As my horse jerked down the grassy slopes that fell away to the jaws of the swamp, I could see thin streams of mist rise slowly, hover like wraiths, above the long rushes and then, turning gradually more material, go blowing heavily away across the flat. The appearance of the place at this desolate hour, so remote from human society and so dar darkly significant of evil presence, struck me with a certain wonder that she should have chosen this spot for our meeting. She was a familiar of the Moors, where I had invariably encountered her, but it was like her arrogant caprice to test my devotion by some, pardon me, by some such dreary assignation. The wide and horrid prospect depressed me beyond reason, but the fact of her neighborhood drew me on, and my spirits mounted at the thought that at last she was to put me in possession of herself. Tethering my horse upon the verge of the swamp, I soon discovered the path that crossed it, and entering struck out boldly for the heart. The track could have been little used, for the reeds, which stood high above the level of my eyes upon either side, straggled everywhere across in low arches, 
through which I dodged and broke my way with some inconvenience and much impatience. A full half hour I was solitary in that wilderness, and when at last a sound other than my own footsteps broke the silence, the dusk had fallen. Pardon me for a moment. I was moving very slowly at the time, with a mind half disposed to turn from the melancholy expedition, which it seemed to me now must surely be a cruel jest she had played upon me. While some such reluctance held me, I was suddenly arrested by a hoarse croaking, which broke out upon my left, sounding somewhere from the reeds in the black mire. A little further it came again, from close at hand and when I had passed on a few more steps in wonder and perplexity, I heard it for the third time. I stopped and listened, but the marsh was as a grave, and so taking the noise for the signal of some raucous frog, I resumed my way. But in a little the croaking was repeated, and coming quickly to a stand I pushed the reeds aside and peered into the darkness. I could see nothing but at the immediate moment of my pause I thought I detected the sound of some body trailing through the rushes. My distaste for the for it pardon me, my distaste for the adventure grew with this suspicion, and had it not been for my delirious infatuation, I had assuredly turned back and ridden home. The ghastly sound pursued me at intervals along the track, until at last, irritated beyond endurance, by the sense of this persistent and invisible company, I broke into a sort of run. This, it seemed, the creature, whatever it was, could not achieve, for I heard no more of it and continued my way in peace. My path at length ran out from among the reeds upon the smooth flat of which she had spoken, and here my heart quickened, and the gloom of the dreadful place lifted. The flat lay in the very center of the marsh, and here and there, in it, a gaunt bush or withered tree rose like a specter against the white mists. At the further end, I fancied some kind of building loomed up, but the fog which had been gathering ever since my entrance upon the passage sailed down upon me at that moment, and the prospect went out with suddenness. As I stood waiting for the clouds to pass, a voice cried out to me of its center, Pardon me, let me try that sentence again. As I stood waiting for the clouds to pass, a voice cried to me out of its center, and I saw her next second, with bands of mist swirling about her body, come rushing to me from the darkness. She put her long arms about me, and, drawing her close, I looked into her deep eyes. Far down in them, it seemed to me, I could, desert, I could discern a mystic laughter, dancing in the wells of light, and I had that ecstatic sense of nearness to some spirit of fire which was wont to possess me at her contact. At last, she said, at last, my beloved, I caressed her. Why, said I, tingling at the nerves, why have you put this dolorous journey between us? And what mad freak is your presence in this swamp? She uttered her silver laugh and nestled to me again. I am the creature of this place, she answered. This is my home. I have sworn you should behold me in my native sin ere we, ere you ravished me away. Come then, said I, I have seen. Let there be an end of this. I know you, what you are. This marsh chokes up my heart. God forbid you should spend more of your days here. Come. You are in haste, she cried. There is yet much to learn. Look, my friend, she said to me, you who know me, what I am. This is my prison, and I have inherited its properties. Have you no fear? For answer, I pulled her to me, and her warm lips drove out the horrid humors of the night. But the swift passage of a flickering mockery over her eyes struck me as a flash of lightning, and I grew chill again. I have the marsh in my blood, she whispered, the marsh and the fog of it. Think ere you vow to me, for I am the cloud in a starry night. A lithe and lovely creature, palpable of warm flesh, 
she lifted her magic face to mine and besought me plaintively with these words. The dews of the nightfall hung on her lashes and seemed to plead with me for her forlorn and solitary plight. Behold, I cried, witch or devil of the marsh, you shall come with me. I have known you on the moors, a roving apparition of beauty. Nothing more I know, nothing more I ask. I care not what this dismal haunt means, not what these strange and mystic eyes. You have powers and senses above me. Your spear and habits are as mysterious and incomprehensible as your beauty. But that, I said, is mine, and the world that is mine shall be yours also. She moved her head nearer to me with an, pardon me, with an antic gesture, and her gleaming eyes danced up at me with a sudden flash. The similitude, great heavens, of a hooded snake. Starting, I fell away, but at that moment she turned her face and set it fast towards the fog that came rolling in thick volumes over the flat. Noiselessly, the great cloud crept down upon us, and all dazed and troubled, I watched her watching it in silence. It was as if she awaited some omen of horror and I, too, trembled in the fear of its coming. Then suddenly out of the night issued the hoarse and hideous croaking I had heard upon my passage. I reached out my arm to take her hand, but in an instant the mists broke over us, and I was groping in the vacancy. Something like panic took hold of me, and beating through the blind obscurity I rushed over the flat calling upon her. In a little the swirl went by, and I perceived her hand I perceived her upon the margin of the swamp, her arm raised as in imperious command. I ran to her, but stopped, amazed and shaken by a fearful sight. Low by the dripping reeds crouched a small squat thing, in the likeness of a monstrous frog, coughing and choking in its throat. As I stared, the creature rose upon its legs and disclosed a horrid human resemblance. Its face was white and thin, with long black hair. Its, gnarled, its body gnarled and twisted as with the og of a thousand years. Shaking, it whined in a breathless voice, pointing a skeleton figure, a skeleton finger at the woman by my side. Your eyes were my guide, it quavered. Do you think that after all these years I have no knowledge of your eyes? Lo, is there aught of evil in you I am not instructed in? This is the hell you designed for me, and now you would leave me to greater. The wretch paused and panting leaned upon a bush, while she stood silent, mocking him with her eyes, and soothing my terror with her soft. Here, he cried, turning to me, hear the tale of this woman that you may know her as she is. She is the presence of the marshes. Woman or devil, I know not, but only that the accursed marsh has crept into her soul, and she herself is become its evil spirit. She herself, that lives and grows young and beautiful by it, has its full power to blight and chill and slay. I, who was once as you are, have this knowledge. What bones lie deep in this black swamp, who can say but she? She has drained of health, she has drained of mind and, and of soul. What is between her and her desire that she should not drain also of life? She has made me a devil in her hell, and now she would leave me to my solitary pain and go search for another victim. But she shall not, he screamed through his chattering teeth. She shall not. My hell is also hers. She shall not. Her smiling, untroubled eyes left his face and turned to me. She put out her arms, swaying towards me, and so fervid and so great a light flowed in her face <clears throat> that, as one distraught of superhuman means, I took her into my embrace. And then the madness seized me. Woman or devil, I said, I will go with you. Of what account this pitiful past? Light me even as that wretch, so be only you are with me. 
She laughed and, disengaging herself, leaned, half clinging to me, towards the coughing creature by the mire. Come, I said, catching her by the waist. Come. She laughed again in a silver ringing laugh. She moved with me slowly across the flat to where the track started for the portals of the marsh. She laughed and clung to me. But at the edge of the track I was startled by a shrill, hoarse screaming. And behold, from my very feet that loathsome creature rose up and wound his long black arms around about her shrieking and crying in his pain. Stooping, I pushed, her for, I pushed him from her skirts and with one sweep of my arm drew her across the pathway. As her face passed mine, her eyes were wide and smiling. Then of a sudden the still mist enveloped us once more, but ere it descended I held a glimpse of that contorted figure trembling on the margin, the white face drawn and full of desolate pain. At the sight an icy shiver ran through me, and then through the yellow gloom the shadow of her darted past me to the further side. I heard the hoarse cough, the dim noise of a struggle, a swishing sound, a thin cry, and then the sucking of the slime over something in the rushes. I leapt forward, and once again the fog thinned, and I beheld her, woman or devil, standing upon the verge and peering with smiling eyes into the foul and sickly bog. With a sharp cry wrung from my nerveless soul, I turned and fled down the narrow way from that accursed spot, and as I ran the thickening fog closed around me, and I heard far off and lessening still the silver sound of her mocking laughter. And that is The Devil of the Marsh by H. B. Marriott Watson. Pardon me. Well, I quite like it. Uh, we've uh, got kind of a, a cryptid going on with, um, well, I guess kind of two cryptids, because the woman herself, the, the witch or devil of the marsh, I suppose, sort of qualifies. And then you have the, the deformed, forlorn figure of a, of a previous lover. So I guess both of them, in their way, are kind of cryptids, which is sort of cool. My thoughts on this, on this story. Um, I mean, you can make, you can, th there's lots of theories about, out there about the, the sort of sultry female temptress luring men to their doom and, you know, them sort of being cautionary tales about the places you go and the kind of company you keep and the kind of woman that is acceptable to society at large. However, the part of this story that sticks out most to me is when uh, our narrator says, I have known you on the moors, a roving apparition of beauty. Nothing more I know, nothing more I ask. So, I mean, I guess the ending is kind of ambiguous, whether or not he is eternally trapped in this marsh with this, um, this demon figure who is presumably going to gradually suck the life out of him in order to maintain her own power, but... He was only interested in her because she was pretty. Like, I feel, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being physically attracted to someone. I mean, it, it is actually an important factor in, in most relationships. But when you say that, not only is that all you notice, but that's really all you in, you're interested in, that's, that's the point for me when it gets a, a little bit shallow. Don't, don't pretend that it's, some some sort of grandiose notion of love or bewitchment or that you're you're desperate for this uh for this woman to be yours and a lot of the descriptions in this i find come off as as wanting to be quite possessive of her so on some level i'm on team marsh devil here honestly she hasn't really promised him anything she's warned him that there is more to her appearance than her beauty, which is really all he, he seems to care about. And she does imply that there, like I said, there, there is something about, there will be a, a price that will need to be paid in exchange for, for possessing her, for owning her, which when, 
you read through the story is really the impression you get that that's that's what he wants so I'm kind of on her side here she she's lured this man in and we have no evidence to the contrary so I'm, I'm assuming it was a similar procedure for the frog cryptid dude horror that's wandering around in the groping in the dark in the mists of these swamps so you've got this guy who's only into her for her appearance and is really interested in knowing her and having her not as an equal but as something he can own and possess and have in probably every sense of the word so and she warns him she says hey like there's there's more to this situation there's more to me than uh, than what you might be aware of and he disregards it and it's not until a, a someone else another male uh, or for yeah we'll say he's a male he's a deformed weird frog cryptid monster but he is still he's still a dude uh, says to him, like, no, she's she's a witch, she's a monster, she's a demon. Her and this swamp are gonna, like, sucker you in and, and use you in a very vampiric sort of way to continue their own existence. And only then does he think, like, maybe there's kind of potentially a problem here. He didn't, he didn't seem interested in the, in the admittedly more subtle warnings of the woman herself. What do you guys think? I'm I'm firmly on team team marsh marsh demon marsh devil marsh witch here. Uh, let me know down below in the comments what you think. Uh, if you've enjoyed this story, please uh, like the video. Feel free to subscribe. And if you have a request for uh, an older story that you would like to, would uh, bleh, can't talk which is a problem because I do that a lot in these videos. If there is something that you would like for, for me to read aloud, please feel free to leave it in, uh, in the comments and I will be more than happy to, to look into it. So thank you for being with me for another scary story, especially as we are officially in the start of spooky season now. So uh, enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, day, weekend, wherever you are. Uh, Thanks for hanging out with me for a little while. Bye, everyone.